then I would welcome everyone back to our public session. Uh, we're a couple of minutes behind. Uh, we've been looking forward to this during our, our private session. We, in fact, chatted about um, the importance of this, of this time in the meeting. Uh, recall that there has been multiple ways that we have heard from we the people, if you will, through um, emails, through social media, through uh, entries into a, a survey monkey uh, version. And uh, today we have the first opportunity, opportunity to really hear people in live uh, context and uh, are anticipating that very much. And I'm going to ask Yasmin Ziesler if she would outline the way we are going to proceed from here. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. So uh, folks who have wished to speak have done so on a sign-up sheet. Uh, I'm following those names in order from uh, start to finish in, in terms of sign up. What I will be doing is calling people in order, saying now up and you're the person's name. I will do my best to pronounce names. Um, so I ask everybody's forbearance and then I will say followed by the next person. So the second person up will have a little bit of warning. Um, I will be running a timer and giving a 30 seconds remaining. Um, so at the one minute, 30 second mark, and then 15 seconds of time remaining. Um, and then that speaker will be muted and I will announce. So Yasmin, we're looking for a, a, a targeted amount of, of how much time would you- for uh, each uh, two, mi two minutes per speaker. And, and um, we've been advised that good practice in such meetings, uh, two minutes has been found to be generally quite quite doable. If you feel you don't need a full two minutes, that's fine. But please, out of courtesy uh, for those who are to follow, we want to give as much time and attention to the first speaker as we do to the final. And uh, Yasmin, why don't you go ahead and, and begin? Okay. So first up is Nat Kinney, followed by Rebecca Fleeter. So Nat Kinney. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Nat Kinney. I'm a Johnson State alum and Johnson Select Board member. Uh, my grandmother, Charlene Strait, earned her degree at Johnson State. And 40 years later, my mother earned her degree at Johnson State. For generations, this school has been helping to raise families out of poverty and providing essential workforce for Vermont employers. The demonstrations this weekend, today, and in the week to come show that we Vermonters are committed to fighting with the trustee board, with the trustee board, shoulder to shoulder for funding for NVU, not just for a year, but for sustained long-term funding for the state of Vermont for these essential institutions. Please fight with us for this, for these institutions. They're incredibly important for Vermont. And I thank you for the opportunity again. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. Now up, Rebecca Fleeter. Next up, Adriana Eldred. So now up is Rebecca Fleeter. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, sorry, I'm having audio issues. Um, so my name is Rebecca Fleeter. Uh, I'm a student at Northern Vermont University Johnson. I'm also the editor in chief of our student run newspaper, Basement Medicine. Um, and I come from out of state. I come from New Hampshire um, where the school system, the uh, higher education school system is also um, sort of disabused by its, um, by its legislature. And so um, coming out of state um, Johnson became a home to me. Uh, it's cheaper to come out of state to Johnson than it is um, to go to in-state schools. And when I drove up through the Lamoille County and onto the hill in Johnson, I realized that was going to be my home. Um, I've made my family here. Um, I've planted roots here and I intend to stay. Um, this school is my life. Uh, and I'm not the only one uh, that this, this school means a lot to. Um, 
as you know, uh, thousands of emails, thousands of signatures have gone to you guys in the past couple of days. Um, and that's that's not an accident. That's because people care about these schools and um, couldn't stand to see them closed. It's it's not just um, it's not just the Vermont State College system that is taking a hit. It's the whole of Vermont. Um, and so I implore you, um, reach out to the governor uh, and the lieutenant governor and the legislature. We know that they support us in this. Um, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman's um, press conference so. yesterday uh, really uh, just underlined for me how how much support we have from the legislature. So um, I also implore you to be more transparent um, and encourage your office to be seconds. more transparent. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Now up, Adriana Eldred. Next up, Lucy Rogers. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Adriana Eldred and I'm a senior at Northern Vermont Uni University Johnson and I'm double majoring in studio arts and journalism. And we are all aware of how much attention this uh, has garnered from the public and most notably our legislatures. Uh, while we have, while you have acknowledged the spiraling demographics, you have failed to recognize that we also are losing people because we haven't provided the quality education both faculty and students want. Contrary to what you said, moving these campuses will deny access to higher education for hundreds of college students who cannot move to Castleton and create a disproportionate geographical barrier to the Northern tier of Vermont. And you will hear all of those reasons by the rest of the people in line for this comment. Furthermore, you will be systematically denying access to higher education for Vermonters who need it and destroying the economies of these communities, whether you accept that or not. Not only should we be continuing to advocate for increased state appropriations as we all have been for a long time with this renewed legislative uh, support, but we should be putting together a task force that can analyze and present how we will restructure our college systems without losing any campuses to the legislature. If you value your community, then you need to listen to it because we are all ready to take this to the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Now up Lucy Rogers, followed by Matt Hill. Thank you, I'm Lucy Rogers and I'm the state representative from Waterville and Cambridge. I have two main points I want to make and they're quick. Um, first, higher education is changing. We need to keep up with these trends or all of our colleges will be in peril, not just the three campuses discussed in this proposal. What we need is a creative revamping of the entire Vermont State College system. And this is really an opportunity for Vermont to be a national leader in imagining how higher ed can flourish in the 21st century. Second, the outpouring of support, energy, ideas, and creativity that have come from the effective communities in the last three days, I think make it incredibly apparent that no one is better equipped to solve a community problem than members of that community. Any path going forward must include input and brainstorming from members of the communities that will be most affected about how to maintain continuity of higher education throughout all regions of the state. As we go forward, please consider working with the legislature to find a year of bridge funding and keep the campuses open while the affected communities and Vermont's most creative minds have a chance to come together to envision an even better future for the Vermont State College system. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Now up Matt Hill, followed by Laura Gannon. Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Matt Hill. Uh, I am a representative from Johnson, born and raised in Johnson, and a Johnson State College graduate. I have a few uh, uh, proposals I would like to list off for you. Um, and over the past uh, few days, communications from the State College system have been blaming the legislature for its issues. That is only partly correct. You should blame past legislature starting in 1985. The past three years, the Vermont State Colleges have experienced the friendliest legislature since Jeb first took office in the Senate in 1985, as he described the recent increases in the beginning of his presentation. 
there's no doubt colleges in general need to adjust, which is already happening. The move to online has been a positive move and there should be more of that. I recommend turning over innovation to the people who are good at it. I have faith in the presidents of the colleges to adjust over time. Any proposal other than the current one is probably a better proposal. Presidents like President Collins have done a great job adjusting to the new world. Right when it seemed like NVU was gaining a foothold, this recommendation is executing it. We have not given them a chance to succeed. According to the claim that students are less likely to go to a physical campus, then logically, the recommendation should be closing down Castleton because they have too many dorms. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that because Castleton also serves Southern Vermont and they are vital to their communities. According to NVU's economic impact study, there's a, there's a hundred million uh, economic impact every year, which has also given me ammo on, on the, the floor for debate. This, this recommendation, Jeb has lots of confidence of students, staff, and faculty. Jeb's it's recommendation has seconds. damaged Vermont colleges for the foreseeable future and the chance of plan going forward. That being said, uh, uh, before John, uh, Vermont has lost confidence in Jeb, and this is ill-advised recommendation at this point, the pandemic will negatively affect Vermont yeah. for generations. Thank you. Uh, next up, Laura Gannon, followed by Beth Foy. Hi, my name is Laura Gannon and I am um, a CCB United uh, Faculty Academic Chair. And uh, one of the best advice I've ever received from my mom is to never make a major decision in the middle of a crisis. And right now we are in the biggest crisis, hopefully, <laughs> of our lives. You know, we're worried about um, being killed by a virus, our loved ones being killed, losing our jobs and having, you know, going into a deep depression. Um, so although they say, the experts say that the COVID crisis will last about 12 to 18 months, um, the board is making a decision that will have uh, impact for generations of Vermonters to come. So I'm encouraging the board to um, put off any major decisions for at least another year um, and to be thoughtful of the decisions that you make um, and how it impacts our students and faculty and staff and our Vermonters. Um, so it will put them into a, a crisis um, where students may drop out uh, faculty and staff who have dedicated you know, 10, 15, 20, or even 30 years of their life to the Vermont State Colleges. They'll be unemployed, lose their health insurance. And our small, um, you know, rural Vermont, our little uh, shops and stores that our students and faculty support um, will we'll not recover. I think it'd be a struggle for them to recover with the COVID. Um, I, I apologize. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> so I'm just asking you to put um, put up making major changes um, for another year, and that will give us time to maybe have some other eyes to look at the problem, some innovative thinking, um, engage the community more, um, more creative problem solving, um, and even a, a, a way we can make the VSC the college more competitive in this new environment. And so there, where there's a will, there's a way. Thank you. And my apologies, uh, I'm calling time there. Uh, next up is Beth Foy, followed by Jesse Streeter. Beth Foy. Thank, sorry, I didn't, that was kind of weird. Um, my name is Beth Foy. I'm a Johnson resident. Um, I would just like to point out a few things. I'm a numbers person and I am a very rational and logical person. Um, when I look at the state budget right now, state budget higher education is 1.5% of our total budget. Commerce and um, community development is 1.7%. Um, labor is 0.7%. Corrections is 2.49%. Um, debt service is 1.34%. My point in, in bringing up these numbers for these other agencies is that the decision to close these schools will directly impact the overall budget of our state. It will adversely impact those agencies we're talking about. And if those agencies have not been part of this conversation, that's of serious concern. Um, I second everything Lucy said and I second everything Matt said, we need innovation 
innovation in all of the thought and the way we approach this problem. Um, it's not a new problem, but it is a problem that needs some new leadership. I beg of you to bring more people into this conversation. It is not a conversation that should be made by 14, 15, 16 people. It's a conversation that be, should be made by many, many people with many impacts. Um, I also just would like to point out that our um, state has had a um, goal of increasing youth within the state. This directly conflicts with growth efforts of the state widely. It um, directly conflicts with all economic, economic growth opportunities we have out there. It directly conflicts with many, many initiatives the state has taken. This board needs to think holistically and not be selfish in the decisions you're making. Please include both community members, representation from these communities who are not properly represented on this board, I would argue, um, as, as well as um, the Okay. Thank you, Beth. Uh, and I, I apologize here. Please understand the technology is a little awkward to be to be doing this. Um, so apologies to speakers. We're, we're doing our best here. Um, next up is Jesse Streeter, followed by Michelle Wade. Hi, my name is Jesse Streeter. I'm a senior at Northern Vermont University Johnson, the student government president and a former student trustee on the board. I'd like to start out by saying that I completely understand the position you are in, that there's no easy way for the VSCS to get out of this current financial hardship, that something is going to need to change going forward. However, this recommendation and the hasty vote that was initially proposed with a severe lack of transparency disturbed me. As a member of the board last year, I thought I could expect better. I don't understand how a decision can be reached in such a short amount of time without releasing more information to the public and allowing for public comment to infiltrate the system. The people that you are on this board to serve are calling and I hope you all are listening. Additionally, Senator Flory brought up a good point about facility maintenance earlier. I think a lot of us would like to see the financial layout of how the VSCS plans to cover retirement, bonded indebtedness, and the cost involving, involved with maintaining facilities of the three campuses that have been proposed to close down before any sort of vote happens. It'd be great to know if the VSCS projects to be able to cover these expenses, working with what would be a significantly smaller base, or do you plan to go with the, uh, go to the state legislature to supply these funds, uh, which would be, um, uh, it would seem unlikely they'd support such requests considering the at least five county region this plan would absolutely devastate. Either way, I know that there are going to be efforts made from multiple directions to encourage a different course of action. I just wholeheartedly hope that you keep an open mind over the next week and into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Good to hear from you. Yeah. Next up, Michelle Wade, followed by Chris Chichester. I apologize, uh, Michelle has requested we skip her. So next up is Chris Chichester followed by Victor Eli. Chris. Uh, I will hold on Chris, uh, but uh, next up is Victor Eli. Victor Eli, okay. Next up is Katie Orest. So you asked me, maybe we ought to, uh, you know, go three in advance or something like that to give yeah. people time. Yeah. Maybe she's maybe she go back and start again where you left off and just give them, we've, you know. Yeah, we've confirmed that um, Chris is no longer here. I don't okay. have confirmation yet about Victor Eli. Victor Eli, can we try that again? This is Victor, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, yes, my name is Victor Ely, Professor Emeritus of Union Institute and University. I am a humanitarian at heart and I am torn by the testimony of others. 
I served Norwich University for 20 years, both as a tenured professor and in academic administration at Vermont College. Just 10 years after Norwich acquired Vermont College, the Norwich Board of Trustees began questioning the costs of maintaining two campuses, including significant deferred maintenance. Many board members were looking at the already declining enrollments in both public and private higher education in Vermont and the region. But it took another 10 years before they were willing to make the difficult decision to sell the Vermont College campus and its academic programs. Now in retirement, uh, but teaching part-time at CCV for the last nine years, I have watched this same trend continue in the Northeast as the number of high school graduates continues to decline and Vermont's population continues to age into retirement, myself included. I have testified for increased funding in the legislature along with the chancellor as a member of the faculty union at CCB and watched him go away with pennies on the dollar that is needed. Vermont is strapped for funds and is right now digging an even deeper hole as we deal with the current pandemic emergency. Although it is prudent to postpone the final vote to seek better coordination with this other constituents, time. in principle, I support Chancellor Spalding's recommendation. I know my legislators. They know me. They shake their heads and tell me all so next up, and apologies, Mr. Chair, we do have um, a, quite a number of additional individuals who've signed up to comment. So we're doing our best to adhere to the two minute. Thank you, limit. please do. Uh, next up is Katie Orost, followed by Newton Wells. Katie. Katie Orost. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, great. Yes. Okay. My name is Katie. I'm a Johnson State College graduate, a mom of four, and my oldest is a junior in the business management program at NVU Johnson. I'm also a Johnson school board member and know intricately how important access to higher education is to our Northern Vermont youth. Many of our families, like mine, cannot afford to leave this state or travel to other parts of the state to receive their degrees. I lived at home and attended NVU, and now my oldest daughter does the same. Without NVU in our community, neither one of us would have had the opportunity to further our education. I am aware of the financial troubles and recognize that actions need to be taken, but I urge the Board of Trustees to look at other options besides closing the three colleges. We need to keep our young people in Vermont and closing these campuses does not help that goal. I urge the trustees to turn to their most valuable assets, the employees of the state colleges. They're the ones that know their schools the best and are the ones that would be able to help us cut costs and or increase revenues. Uh, I wonder if it's possible to look at the individual schools and each of their financials rather than combining them all together. Students need to know, employees need to know, and action needs to be taken, but I urge you not to vote without having considered all possible options. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Next up is Newton Wells, followed by Zoe Clark. So now up is Newton Wells. Newton? Newton? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank oh, you. perfect. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. I'll try to keep this as short as possible. I wrote it up back when we had about a minute to write. So um, I graduated from Johnson State, now NVU, back in 2000 and successfully built a small business that has employed a few people here in Vermont for the past 20 years. I could have not have done either one without access to a local state college near my home. Um, for decades, we've watched many Vermont students and their parents choose to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars outside Vermont on higher education when quality education could be purchased here in Vermont, supporting our local economy. Um, we need to encourage buying local when it comes to education, the same as we do with food and other products. 
Um, when facing the loss of three colleges that are essential to Vermonters and to the town and county economies that they're located in, um, it's time to get serious about keeping young people and their education dollars within our state by encur encouraging people to learn local. Vermonters need to understand that where they spend their education money matters. Support Vermont's economy, choose a Vermont college. Thank you for taking my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Newton. Next up is Zoe Clark, followed by Lola Duffer. So now it's Zoe Clark. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. Yes, we can. Okay. So my name is Zoe and I'm a sophomore at NBU Johnson. I'm currently on exchange at the University of Hawaii. And I got up at 6 a.m. to watch this because I care so much about this. Um, I also can say that being in so-called paradise, there's nothing compared to Johnson, Vermont, this little town of Vermont. I've never experienced such a strong sense of love and community other than this town. And you're saying that Vermont doesn't attract young people but that's exactly what NVU does. NVU attracts a number of out-of-state students due to its unique programs that you can't find anywhere in New England, such as the outdoor education, the wellness alternative medicine, and inclusive childhood education. Coming from New Jersey, I was attracted not only by the childhood education program, but by the community of Johnson itself, which I intend on moving to after I graduate, and so do many of my out-of-state friends. And we need to focus on recruiting students from out-of-state and we can do that, we have done that. This proposal will only drive away young people and families, which is the opposite of what you're saying you're trying to do. Johnson's sense of community and love is one like no other. We need to fight for the progression of the Vermont State Colleges, not the destruction. And please be the leaders that we expect you to be. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. Now up Lola Dufford, followed by Michaela Stone, or Michaela Stone. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah. Lola. Um, hi, so um, I uh, had a question. I was trying to clarify, what, what would the bridge financing be that you would need in order to carry out uh, Jeb's plan? And um, what would the bridge financing be that you would need um, in order to take a year to consider your options as suggested by um, by the speaker and the pro tem. Jeb, are you able to answer? I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't realize I was muted. Excuse me, Lola. Um, it would be a, a, about $25 million either way, uh, but you know, it could be more uh, to put it on, on, on hiatus for a while because we don't know what enrollment's gonna do uh, if we're in hiatus. Uh, but $25 million would be a, a good realm for each of them. So that includes for the current closure plan? Yes. 25 million? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I guess if both would cost 25 million, why not take a year? I, I think, uh, you know, if, if we take a year, um, we it, the cost might go up from there if enrollment uh, is, if people are uncertain about what the future will hold. Jeb, could I also make a point? Sure. So hi, Lola, uh, Steve Wislowski, Chief Financial Officer. You know, a critical difference is that um, if we are required to secure financing from a bank, we're going to need to demonstrate a restructuring plan because our current scenario, we're going to run out of money. Uh, if, however, the General Assembly is willing to step in, um, you know, then I mean, really it's just a matter of, of sizing. So that this is completely supporting Jeb's uh, point that it's about 25 million either way. But if we have to maintain the current structure for a year, then it has to be the General Assembly because I, I really do not think that we would be able to borrow money from a, a private financing source if we were not trying to make structural change. Okay, but the, the ask before the General Assembly at this point is $25 million in addition to your current appropriation. Correct, yes. and, and with Jeb's point that uh, 
enrollments continue to, you know, our enrollment outlook continues to evolve and that could drive an even higher number. Okay, thank you. I appreciate uh, allowing some back and forth. Thanks, so next up, Michael is Stone. Or Michaela, I apologize. Hello, Michaela? Michaela? Um, or Michaela. <laughs> uh, next, followed uh, by Carl Brandon. So I think we'll move on to Carl uh, Brandon. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay. Yeah, great. sorry. The, the message popped up. Michaela Stone. Um, Thank you. I would like to offer the perspective of a professor of education, Vermont education licensure officer, and active member of a longstanding collaboration between higher education and public education in the Northeast Kingdom. The NBU Linden education program is essential in providing quality early childhood educators, classroom teachers, and special educators to schools in our area. Our program is populated by students, many non-traditional and the vast majority commuters who have by and large chosen to take on the effort and cost of a four-year education degree in order to return to the communities in which they have spent their entire lives to teach some of the most socioeconomically challenged students in the state. I am enraged by this decision on behalf of all my students, but particularly my junior cohort, who just last week were eagerly preparing for their apprenticeship and student teaching semesters in our partner schools next year. Castleton is not an option for students with families and roots in the area. They have no options to complete degrees for which they have already put in three years of time, money, and effort. According to the data presented this afternoon by Chancellor Spaulding, they are among over 1,500 current BSc students considered expendable under a plan made by an exclusive group in dark Zoom rooms with no oversight or input from countless stakeholders. I implore you to consider the effects this will have on a generation of children in our communities, and I do so on behalf of Reagan, Brianna, Monique, Caitlin, Karen, Renee, Sierra, Peter, Taylor, Bailey, Caitlin, and Kathy, and the Northeast Kingdom preschool and elementary school students who will never experience their commitment to transformative, reflective, and inclusive education. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. Yeah. Now up is Carl Brandon, followed by Jared Pendick. As I'm Carl Brandon, I've been a professor at Vermont Tech for 43 years. I've been involved with the union and have prepared numbers for them having to do with administration numbers and so on. So I'm very familiar with all the numbers doing this. I have a couple of things. It sounded like earlier comments uh, during the presentation was that the cost to the towns of closing those three colleges has not been considered. And I wouldn't be surprised if the costs, really all of them being considered are greater than the savings by closing the three campuses. Um, it's clear that the people who made the decision at the chancellor's office who know very little about the campuses themselves don't understand what Vermont Tech does to think about moving Vermont Tech to Williston rather than moving Williston to Randolph Center. Um, just as an idea, this morning we were talking about it among the faculty in the faculty union meeting, a couple of things which I have data to support. If we had the national average of administrators and staff per student, we would save $10 million. We currently have 243 faculty and 600 non-faculty. The national average would be a third of that non-faculty, 200. Uh, many ideas have been developed by the faculty and staff at Vermont Tech, and I'm sure at the other schools, and to have these decisions or the proposals being made, again, without any input from the faculty and staff, the people who actually know what is going on, is really outrageous in my mind. Vermont Tech supplies a lot to the economy of Vermont. Uh, a whole bunch of my former students started a company in Randolph, LED Dynamics. They're now the second largest employer with over 100 employees in Vermont. That's what happens in the neighborhood of the residential colleges when graduates go and become entrepreneurs. Thank you. Next up Thanks, now Sarah. is Jared Pendick, followed by Adam Kane. Jared? Uh, if we don't have Jared Pendick, uh, next up, Adam Kane. 
Hi, Adam here. Can you hear me? Yes, Adam. Hi, uh, Adam Kane. I'm the director of the Fairbanks Museum in St. Johnsbury. Uh, so the um, the Fairbanks Museum has had a longstanding relationship with uh, Linden State College and now NBU. When you hear the eye on the sky every day, that's a direct result of the Atmospheric Sciences Program <coughs> at, uh, at LSC. And uh, I wanted to just take um, my time to make a couple of observations and then a request. Um, so my first observation is that, you know, in putting out a plan like this that, that came out on a Friday and had no public input and was uh, such a surprise to those of us who were not, you know, part of its making, uh, it's kind of a self-fulfilling uh, thing that it's, has been done in terms of uh, declining ambitions and trying to and, and having those uh, campuses recruit less students because you've really, you've killed recruiting for the year. <clears throat> and so I would just suggest that that was a really tremendously reckless thing to do. And, and I don't know how that could have happened in a, in a system like BSC. Uh, my second observation is that you talked a lot about the, um, the this being Vermont having the second or lowest um, funding through the state for the system. And, <clears throat> and that's been going on for 10 plus years. And I'd suggest that's really a failure of leadership. Certainly the, the legislature owns that uh, in terms of the, the buck stopping with them, but that's really the job of the board and the chancellor's office to secure that funding. So um, I would encourage you to work on that. I'd also note that you don't have any representatives from the Northeast Kingdom and by statute, you're supposed to have uh, representation from across the state. So my request is that you look at this, uh, take a year, get funding from the legislature, and do a community process <clears throat> where you solicit input and work with your various communities to figure out a plan forward. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And now up will be Eric Osgood, followed by Beverly Taft. Eric Osgood. Okay. So can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Uh, sorry. Yeah, my name is Eric Osgood. I'm the chair of the select board in the town of Johnson. I could tell you about the uh, the colleges. It's our economic engine. I could talk to you about the kids that are served in the region by the college, but I think you guys know all of that stuff. So I want to just talk for a second about the heritage. Johnson has hosted a state higher education facility for well over a century. It started out as a Johnson Normal School. It morphed into the Johnson State, and then the last few years, uh, Northern Vermont University. The university is the heart and soul of this community. Friday, when I heard the, no the uh, news, I felt the knife win the heart of the community with the potential loss of our university. We are ready to stand willing and able to work with the trustees, with the chancellor's office, with the legislature, with the governor to save this college. And I appreciate it's going to need reform. It's going to have to be sustainable, but it is worth saving. And I would just implore that you, you think about this. I think the will of the legislature is there now to help and make sure that you are successful. And I know the will of this community is to do everything that we can to help you be there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And now up is Beverly Taft, followed by Nancy Thompson. Thank you all for giving me a moment. For 20 years, I've been a school counselor in two of the most financially insecure communities in Vermont, having spent the past 16 at Randolph Union. In my role as school counselor, I have the working knowledge of numerous colleges and universities throughout North America. In addition, I'm also a member of the UVM Counselor Advisory Board, which when paired with my close working relationships with all VSC schools, I believe I have some understanding in terms of how our state's colleges and universities function in terms of meeting the financial and educational needs of our state's most economically diverse learning population. 
I have found VTC Randolph and MVU to have been vital partners with my school in developing post-secondary exploratory opportunities, providing personalized instant decision days, and working tirelessly to provide a path of financial <clears throat> a path out of financial insecurity for so many of my most marginalized learners through their programming opportunities. While I appreciate UVM and CSU, I have yet to see them replicate this intensive student-centered approach. What became painfully obvious to me during today's Board of Trustees meeting is that these transformative proposals, I'm sorry to say, are nothing short of attack on the most vulnerable in our state. Further disenfranchising lower SES students, lessening access to training and degree programs in the trades, and creating actual physical geographic barriers to higher ed. This impression was solidified in hearing the chancellor making a statement that he knew these proposals would impact the most vulnerable of learners and in hearing the comment from President Moulton that the initial proposal from the chancellor was to fully shutter VTC. This is classism in the most blatant form. While I understand VSC has, is in dire financial straits, this proposal flies in the face of equity and access. Shame on us for entertaining these current proposals. In doing so, it shows an utter disregard for the impact this will have on communities that are already in dire financial situations, and it shows a willingness to turn our backs on the learners who need us the most. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. And now up is Nancy Thompson, followed by Meredith Dolan. Hi, this is Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you for letting me speak. As both a parent and an instructor, I'm appalled. The lack of transparency and the lack of communication for a plan of this magnitude is unthinkable. Trustees themselves have said that they have been aware of issues for 15 years, yet the NVU consolidation was allowed to go forward. And last year, President Collins put forth lots of effort with students and her own word to deny rumors that the college was closing when in fact that now seems to have been the plan all along. And the biggest impression I take away from this meeting is the utter lack of regard for students because students are absolutely not at the center of this plan. I would hope to see a plan that would assure students of being able to complete their programs, that would have identified articulation plans, that would show ways to grandfather students into other schools with their existing graduation requirements. And instead, you all are choosing to focus on colored lines and predictions and numbers rather than students who are real people and ways to support their success. My daughter, who is one of those expendables, is seven classes from graduation at Linden. When I leave this meeting, I get to tell her, your program is probably going to close, and we have no idea how you're going to finish, because you have no idea how she is going to finish. If this was your child, what would you say and do? You know, what you are doing may be unavoidable. Maybe the schools need to close, but how and when you have chosen to do this was not unavoidable. These are choices. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Now up is Meredith Dolan, followed by Olivia uh, Tabbitt. Hi there. Uh, my name is Meredith Dolan. I'm the village manager for the village of Johnson. I'll try and keep this brief as many uh, folks from Johnson have already very eloquently spoken about the very severe impacts the closure of the MBU campus and Johnson would have on our community. Um, but I just wanted to point out um, for the village provides the uh, three utilities that uh, serve the NBU Johnson campus, electric, water, and wastewater. Uh, the closure of the campus would significantly impact the operations of those utilities, which serve the entire community um, to the tune of about a 30% loss of revenues. Um, obviously that would have ripple effects throughout the community. Um, and I'm same sure it's the same situation in Linden and Randolph as well. Um, those changes would you know, damage our goals for future economic development, setting us even further back. Uh, we've had plenty of challenges over the last few years, and this would just be another severe blow to our efforts to really improve uh, the economy in Lamoille County. Um, obviously, we uh, know that there are serious financial problems. Um, I listened very intently to the presentation and certainly understand what you're dealing with. Um, but we would certainly advocate for continued operations on the campus. Um, we know that there may be changes in our future, um, but as others have said, it'll be absolutely critical to involve the local communities in those discussions. Uh, municipal leaders, business leaders um, in the community really need to be part of those discussions to figure out uh, a path forward for everyone. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alaya. Uh, now up, uh, I'm sorry, I believe now is up is Alaya Tabbitt, followed by Candy Daniels. I regret that. Hi, I'm Alia Thabit. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. I am an alum of Linden State College and a part-time instructor at Linden State College. When I realized in my 30s that I really needed a college education in order to make a decent living, it was Linden where I went to school. It would have been utterly impossible for me to go to college if it weren't for Linden because it was 10 miles away from where I lived. I couldn't go to weekend programs or low residency programs. I was a parent of two children. By the time I was a junior at Linden, I was a single parent of two children. I have made my living since my graduation in 1993 on that degree, first at Johnson, at CCV, and since 19, uh, I think, 89, no, 99 at Linden State College as a part-time instructor. I have met an endless succession of students in the same boat as me who would never have been able to go to college without some place close by. You can't drive an hour and change to even Montpelier and still have a job, still be home when your children come home from school, still do anything else is because it was close that I could do it. We do need change. Obviously, all these things have made that clear, but depriving the most vulnerable citizens in these most economically disadvantaged areas of the state is wrong. I call upon the board and the legislature, rather than slashing the wrists of the state college system, double our funding, invest in Vermont and all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Candy Daniels, followed by Pam Doyle. Candy Daniels. Candy Daniels. I'm going to go on to Pam Doyle. Pam Doyle. Hi, my name is Pam. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Okay. My name is Pam Doyle. Thank I you. am a current student at the Johnson campus of NVU. Mm -hmm. And um, I cannot stress enough of what Alia just said, who I actually am one of her former students. Um, I am 44, 45 years old, and I would have never been able to go back to school if Castleton was my only option. I live in Topsom, Vermont, at the very bottom of the Northeast Kingdom. Um, to get to Castleton, it would take me two hours for an hour and a half class. I'd be in the car for literally five hours in a day. It is impossible. Um, I attend Johnson because that is, even that is a stretch for me, but that is a doable um, process. One of the other things that I would really like to stress to the board is I heard <clears throat> Chancellor Spalding uh, mention that uh, adult students or, or adult uh, residents in Vermont are not likely to utilize the liberal arts colleges. I could not disagree with that more. CCV is a wonderful college, but it is also used as a stepping stone for higher education for bachelor's degrees. Um, and one of the other things that stressed me very much in this process was there was no plan for um, program options uh, for transference. Certain programs like teacher education are specifically designed through each college. If I was to transfer to Castleton, I would not be able to transfer. I'd have to literally start all over again. They're designed differently for each college. Um, I am six classes away from graduating. And so I, as an adult student, have no idea what this would mean for my degree. And I am now um, invested in this program and in this degree. This and the same goes for my daughter who is about to um, finish a degree from CCV, 
and move on to Johnson. And that was her plan because it offers the same types of opportunities where she potentially could graduate this is with, uh, uh, could graduate without a debt um, that consists of more than Okay, uh, apologies. Um, Beth Walsh is up next, followed by Linda Olden. Hi, can you Beth hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Great. I'm Beth Walsh, past president of the Vermont State College's United Professionals. I'm the current chapter chair of NVU Johnson and the director of career development. I'm sorry that you can't see all of the people on this call because you would be overwhelmed with the color red to show our support for education and overwhelmed with the strength and dedication of our students, staff, and faculty who are fighting hard for education in Vermont for Vermonters. As the executive board knows, I tend to avoid conflict and have, a, have to feel very strongly about something to take a risk of offending someone. I felt pretty strongly on Thursday, but nothing like I feel today. So please listen, because I honestly don't care who I offend, offend today. Friday's announcement could not have been more damaging and destructive. I cannot believe how poorly this proposal was presented. On the bright side, the legislators are finally listening because we have been talking about this for years. I've witnessed the chancellor's testimony to various committees in the state house and I've testified myself. But what really is bothering me now is the fact that for some reason, the legislature apparently didn't realize just how dire our need was. The governor talks about not bailing us out, but that was never what we asked for. We asked for the significant funding that the state was obligated to provide, yet did not provide for 40 years plus. Why didn't the decision makers in Montpelier understand? We've had some champions and Anthony Polina and Matt Hill come to mind among others, but for some reason, our chancellor did not make our needs understood nor the results of continued underfunding understood. What that was your and is your job Instead of working with the legislature to find a way to sustain higher education for our youth, you and your team explored options and made decisions behind closed doors and then announced your terrible plan to the world just a few days before the vote scheduled for today. That seems very cowardly and manipulative. Your job is to work with our state to support our system for the benefit of Vermont. You've not done that. I therefore suggest that you submit your resignation immediately and get out of our way because we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank Next you, up. Beth. I, I believe this might be Linda Olson and not Linda Olden, um, followed by Amy Nixon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. And it is Linda Olson. Thank you, Yasmin. I misspelled my own name. Um, I just wanted to say the level of disrespect shown to faculty, staff, and students of the VSC by the chancellor and the executive committee of the board has been stunning. Faculty and staff were notice, uh, notified on Friday that this proposal would mean 500 community members would lose their jobs. It was delivered via a PowerPoint presentation and the chancellor did not even have the courtesy, courtesy to show up and deliver this message. It was reckless, irresponsible, and reprehensible that this message was delivered on a Friday and the vote was intended to take place on Monday. I have yet to hear any information about the financial impact this will have on the communities where the campuses reside. I have yet to hear how Castleton would have the capacity to take on the NVU students. Campuses were operating by Saturday as if the vote had already taken place. In short, this has been a complete disaster. The fact that it was done when our community, students, faculty, and staff are already reeling from COVID-19 is heartless. I know our campuses are struggling, but I also know the chancellor is capitalizing on COVID-19 to push through an agenda he has wanted for a long time. The chancellor and board have lost sight of our mission to serve the public good. Instead, I have heard that Southern New Hampshire University brought up repeatedly as a model that's effective. SNHU is a private university whose online program is a degree mill. Is this really the future you are proposing for us? I hope not. And I hope that you will have a conversation with our legislators to figure out a way forward and not pass this horrible, horrible proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Next is Amy Nixon, followed by Taylor Hollis. Hello. Hello. We, can hear, we can hear you. Yes. Hi, Church. Um, following up on what uh, Linda just asked, um, I'm, I'm calling in from the Caledonian record over in the Northeast Kingdom, 
Um, earlier, I heard Jeb talking about um, how the Northeast Kingdom was not going to be abandoned by the system. Um, he talked a little bit about the, how the Community College of Vermont, Vermont Tech and Castleton um, would somehow step up to offer instruction in the Northeast Kingdom as well as Northern Vermont. Um, and I'm wondering what that, I know it's, there's a lot going on, but do you have any way that you can explain to us um, pretty quickly what that looks like? And if any employees who will be displaced may find um, jobs doing that, or will you be uh, asking faculty from those places or online instructors to pick up those jobs? I'm wondering if there's any opportunity for people who may lose jobs to get some of that work to keep education happening in the kingdom. Thank you. And that's too soon to say. Uh, Community College of Vermont does have locations in Morrisville and St. Johnsbury and Newport. Uh, they mm -hmm. will stay. Uh, okay. And we will be, over time, if, if this proposal were to be adopted, find ways that we can uh, offer, uh, you know, two plus twos. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and online would be part of it too, but not exclusively. Uh, it, would be, it would be something that would have to develop over time. It's a, it's a big lift to uh, you know consolidate the two campuses uh, over the summer. So that would take a lot of energy right there at the same time as community college is doing what it can do. Uh, and you know keep in mind that Vermont Tech does have a site in Linden and Newport with nursing and could yes. bring more there over time. Thank you, Jeb. So now up is Taylor Hollis, but I understand that perhaps Taylor Hollis has left the meeting. So next up is Alexander Terriel, followed by Stephen Nichols. So we're moving on to Alexander Terriel. Hi. Hello. Okay, so hi, my name is Alexander Terriel. Um, I'm from Berlin, New Hampshire. Um, I would like to start off by saying that um, online classes um, really aren't working. I'm a graphic design major. Uh, I cannot dish out $1,000 to get a brand new laptop that could actually successfully hold the program that I need for this degree. Um, and on top of that, it makes it really difficult when it's crashing half the time and I go to talk to IT support and all I get told was, oh, well, it should work fine. So that's great news. Um, you know, another thing I really want to touch on is how the, the you know, the economy is going to do. Um, I am from, you know, Berlin, New Hampshire. Um, you know, back in the day, it was always, you know, booming and it was great. And then when our paper mill closed down, uh, our economy went down with it. Um, the only thing keeping us as the city of Berlin right now um, is the fact that we have both a state and federal prison, um, you know, helping us keep that population number up. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't want to see any of these economies turn into my economy uh, because there's nothing to do. No one will want to move here. And, you know, you want, you know, these teachers to move, but how are they going to move if they own a house, if no one's going to come and buy their house, for instance? Um, a lot of people have made their homes here. I know several people who their only income is the school, and then moving them, they're just going to lose everything, and they're not going to be able to do anything, um, which is scary to think of. Um, so, you know, just kind of keeping that in mind of not only will, you know, our education be going down, because personally, um, going to Caltech is not an option for me. Um, I could not do that and make that work with everything that I need to do. Um, I can't afford that. It's just not convenient enough and it's not going to work for me. 15 seconds. Um, that's all I have to say. You know, so really listen to what everyone's saying, please and thank you. Uh, please, you know, make sure we are looking up and kind of giving attention and eyes. And everyone have a good day and thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. So now up is Stephen Nichols, followed by Jeffrey Cohen. Thank you. And um, I'll begin by telling you that I am a 26 year resident of the Northeast Kingdom. I'm originally from New York City. So I'm, if I'm outspoken, that's the way it is. Um, my first thoughts, a couple of people have mentioned this, they wanted to see the financials by school, as would I. Um, it, it would be good to know which schools are performing in which categories. Um, we'd also like to see the numbers that show why only keeping one of the two NVU campuses would not be a, a suitable, sustainable option. I would tell you that if you close Linden, what you annihilate basically is a world-class atmospheric 
services program. We heard from Adam Kane before. Uh, there are meteorologists, and, and you also do the same thing to an amazing video program, too. So many of the people you see on television, not just in Vermont, but all around New England and all around the United States, have come out of this school. Poof. It magically goes away. Uh, I've been here since one o'clock, paying attention as much as I can while I'm trying to get some work done, too. Uh, I'm, I'm a little taken back by some of the technical illiteracy that I've seen trying to happen around here. Uh, those so-called survey monkeys have been around and, and effective for many, many years. I'm also stunned, quite honestly, to hear from, more in the beginning, uh, the tenures of uh, some of you have served on this board. I've been on eight boards in the last 15 years. I never served more than nine years. Most of them were four or five. If you've been on a board for 15 or 20 years, I would respectively, respectfully suggest that you step aside and allow new people come in. But my main comment would be a plea for leadership. It's clear that um, Mr. Spaulding has been working on this particular plan for many, many years. Those of us in the kingdom have discussed this with business people, with educators, and with representatives. We knew what was coming. The timing is horrible. If I had any sort of vote at all, it would be one of zero confidence. I plead for leadership from the legislature and from this board be aware of unintended. This is time we're uh, going on. We have a very long list, Mr. Chair, at this point of additional speakers. Understood. So next up is Jeffrey Cohen, followed by Morgan Easton. Jeffrey Cohen. Jeffrey? Jeffrey. Hello, this is Jeff Cohen. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. great. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you. So, uh, so my name is Jeff Cohen. I'm alumni of JFC 1990, and I am a business person. So I'm coming to this with a much different perspective, I think. Um, there are a couple of things that struck me uh, pretty seriously about this whole thing. Um, first, the sudden announcement, as you has heard, as you have heard, um, was disastrous. Uh, the word FUBAR comes to mind. But more importantly is this, it seems like this plan has been in place for a while because during earlier today, there were many people who chimed in on numbers and assumptions that were created, which means this is not a last minute plan. What that also tells me is that many, many alternatives have not been explored. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with three of them right now, okay? First one is this. You talk about the fact that there are less and less young people in Vermont, but there are a great many people who want to come to Vermont. And in fact, the COVID-19 virus has led nearly 80% of second homeowner use, homeowners in Vermont to relocate to Vermont with their families and their children. Second, when I was in college, we had people from Togo, the Philippines, Denmark, Kuwait, and I am the board of advisors on an international scholar company and there's over 250,000 students who have the means and the finance to come to the US to study. So if you need heads and beds, I will take care of that. 30 seconds. Third thing, by doing what you're doing, not only are you jeopardizing the education of the students, but most importantly, you are risking the state's economic condition in two ways. VSAC, 15 seconds. Is going to get killed with students who sue to get out of their loans because they did not receive the education promise. And the federal government is going to wipe up the remainder of the college system with nearly $70 million in lost federal student loans that get relieved because students didn't get the education promise. And that right there is worse than anything else you guys have. Thank you, that's time. Thank you, Jeffrey. Next up is Morgan Easton. Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? 
Oh, sorry. I have my phone and my computer on, and this is my first Zoom call ever. Um, let me take off my phone, and sorry for wasting your time. Take this moment to stretch, please. Everyone stand up out of your chair. <laughs> it's nice to hear your voice, Morgan. All right. I think I figured it out. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Take your head. Yes. Okay, great. So um, my name is Morgan Easton. I graduated from VTC in 2018. I also served on the board of trustees in 2016 and 17. And I'm a lifelong resident of the greater Randolph area. So I'll spare you and just say shortly, I strongly oppose the last ditch effort to save the Williston campus. Um, but I'd like to just bring up one case here that I have an example of from when I was a trustee that makes me very concerned with how this recommendation announcement was rolled out like so many other folks. The year I served, the recommendation was brought to you all, us, the board, to create what we now know as U, uh, NVU. The amount of outcry from the communities of these colleges was overwhelming at the time against this decision. The proof was brought to the table from various faculty and staff with regard to this not being sustainable or viable solutions for these institutions over time. This recommendation seems to be a promise from the chancellor to save these colleges for the future generations. And as I recall, the board voted unanimously despite the outcry. Um, so church, with regard to bringing attention to the amount of work that went into this recommendation, we also need to recognize the amount of work that's gone on among students, faculty and staff over many years that are ingrained in these institutions that have come up with viable solutions and recommendations about the individual institutions to thrive. They bring them to the board and they are rarely taken into action by the chancellor and the board. So Jeb, you said there's fires to be put out everywhere across the system. If we look in the last five years of some of the biggest fires that have been caused within the system, what proposals cause those fires? So let's look at that. And I, rec I recommend you all as a board to look really closely at this recommendation, how it was rolled out and not consider this recommendation by the chancellor. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Well, next up is Deborah Bowden, followed by Hope Waterfield. Hi, um, I, uh, I worked at Johnson as Director of Marketing and Communication for nearly eight years before I resigned in January of 2017. The reason for that resignation was um, I had lost respect for and confidence in Mr. Spaulding. Um, his scattershot approach to marketing, uh, I'm sorry, to making changes, his lack of understanding of and appreciation for what was happening on the ground, his ongoing communication gaffes that undercut the work that was going on on the ground level by the staff and President Collins. Um, and frankly, I, what I saw as a complete ignorance of, of what really happens on the ground and what is really required to successfully merge Lyndon and Johnson. The word that we got was, we'll figure that out as we go along. Let's get moving. We have to go quickly. Um, so over the past few years, I've cheered on my former colleagues from the sidelines. They've done a Herculean effort to make the merger work in the face of unimaginable lack of planning and a profound shortage of resources and staff Frankly, what they've managed to pull off is nothing short of spectacular. And to think that you would do all of that and put people through that and then toss it out the window is beyond comprehension to me. I, much of my, um, what I wanted to say has already been said, but I would like to just emphasize the issue of equity and access is huge. You're cutting out the most vulnerable part of our state and the most vulnerable students. Um, I also would suggest that the cost of closing and the in economic impact this would cause would far exceed the cost of bridge funding. Through seconds. Uh, the gentleman, I believe it was Jared, who said this was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Indeed, this is not the first time, uh, Jeb, that, that you have said something or rolled something out that undercut what was so that is very mind blowing. Thank you, that's time. Uh, my understanding is Hope Waterfield is you, not Deborah. in the meeting anymore. Next up is Bailey Levitt, followed by Nate Ball. Bailey Levitt. Hello. We hear Hello, you. can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
All right. First off, I'd like to say that the way that this uh, plan was rolled out is an absolute shame on your guys' part and a total disgrace to the Vermont State Colleges. Um, thank you very much for ruining my college. Uh, Chancellor Spaulding, how dare you say that the colleges you are proposing to close benefit students who wouldn't be successful elsewhere? Who are you to make such a statement? Maybe those students chose one of these schools for different reasons. I know for a fact I did. I chose VTC for the welcoming atmosphere, small campus, and most importantly, the hands-on training. I'm a first year student in the diesel power technology program at Vermont Tech in Randolph. I am not from Vermont. I am actually from Massachusetts. And the cost of my education is not affordable. So to imply that I chose VTC because I wouldn't be successful elsewhere or because my family can't afford a different college is absolutely false. How am I supposed to finish my degree? Not many options are available with such short notice. Chancellor Spaulding, you state that people have enough time to make alternate plans, but that is not realistic. Simply not enough time. Please elaborate how you think a student can make alternate plans to attend a technical college to continue their hands-on training to complete their degrees. They cannot complete their degrees online. Despite what you may think, people cannot learn everything online. Labs are essential. You claim you have been aggressive and not sitting around, but yet you keep accepting students. And now within mere months notice, we are finding out that we will be unable to obtain our degrees as planned, shameful. If this has been a problem that has been discussed for years, then why was action not taken sooner to prevent students, faculty, and the local communities to be blindsided and left in despair with no real time to prepare or react? At the very least, we should have been given one year notice and the students should have been made aware of the deficits upon so that informed decisions could have been made. That's you tough. have mentioned multiple times that you do not have time to not act. I agree with Thank you. Next Thank up you. is Thank Nate Ball. Sorry, next up is Nate Ball followed by Sarah Emery. Hi, this is Nate. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we Hello. can. Hello, my name is Nate Ball. I work at Vermont Technical College in Randolph, and I'm also the vice president for the VSCUP. Uh, we fully recognize the need for change. We know our institutions must right size to accommodate lower enrollment for now in the future. Where we disagree is with the chancellor's steps that are needed to create a system that's a system that's solvent today and beyond. You must have heard all the faculty and staff have voted no confidence in the chancellor. You also must have heard that there was a petition sent out by a student to save our institutions with over 33,000 signatures. You also must have heard the protesters this morning in Montpelier honking their horns protesting the chancellor's proposal. The faculty and staff and students have spoken and you must listen to our demands. We want the chancellor to resign and we want the pres President Collins and Moulton to lead us into a direction of solvency. Lastly, we ask that you do not accept the chancellor's proposal Instead, we ask that you work with our state government for alternatives to buy us time while we work with our presidents to explore what is the best way to move forward for our campus communities because we do believe in their leadership and we do trust their leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Nate? Uh, I understand that Sarah Emery is not in the meeting any longer, so we're going to go on to Kurt Kolovson, uh, followed by Les Kanat. Kurt? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, bring this up. So I'm an alumnus of Linden State College. In order to help make these campuses more impactful and relevant to helping Vermont become a vital contributor to the 21st century economy, 